Thank you, Nicole, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. As we continue to navigate through this challenging time, we're very happy to be able to bring you information you can use right now, the chance to share your thoughts and get questions answered, and the ability to keep us all connected until we can meet again. It's through the efforts of our corporate and founding members that we're able to provide you with this series of webinars, and it's yet another example of members helping members. Today, members of IOP Strategic Advisory Board are coming together to do just that. These leaders are not here just to lend their expertise to guide IOP, but to guide the industry as well. So if you have questions or comments you want to share during this webinar, please use the Q&A feature that you'll find at the bottom or side of your screen. And if you would like to replay this webinar at any time, this will be available within 24 hours in our Knowledge Center and on our COVID-19 resource page. If you have any other questions, please feel free to just drop us a note and we can connect you with the members um, on this panel today. And now please allow me to introduce our panel moderator, Atul Vashit. He's CEO of NEO Group and Vice Chair of IOP Strategic Advisory Board, and he will introduce the panel. Atul, it's all yours. Thank you, Debbie. I'm delighted that IOP gets an opportunity to reach back out to its members and talk about the roadmap for the future. If you go back and take a look at the last six weeks, one of the things you will notice that IOP on its website has a number of resources for how members are addressing, dealing with, and helping each other during COVID-19. I encourage you to be able to do that. One of the things that's unique about IOP is that we actually have multiple stakeholders that we bring together, and that's what we're doing from the board on this call. So today we have with us Vess, who is the VP of IT Operations for Bristol Myers Squibb, longtime IOP member and an industry leader. We have Karen, who's a managing director of Accenture, and again, a very longtime board member. And then Neil Hirschman, who is the chairman of IOP, but also a partner from Kirkland and Ellis. Vess, Karen, and Neil, thank you so much for joining us. The focus of today's discussion is going to be Roadmap to the Future, which is how do we restore and rethink sourcing today, but also going forward? I encourage the audience to please jump in, ask questions. I'm gonna take questions while the session is going on. And we will also, if we are not able to answer all your questions, address it after the session. Also, we will be conduct conducting two different polls. And so please make sure you respond when, that, when those polls come up. So Karen, let me start with you. You know, we've seen significant changes, particularly in the last six weeks. If you think about the US market and maybe eight weeks or so when you think outside the US. When you think about the sourcing landscape, what do you think we have learned in the last six to eight weeks about third parties and our sourcing partners? Hey, Atul, I, I think, um, well, from my vantage point, we've seen a couple of key themes emerge. One is that systems resilience has come to the forefront as being a significant pain point. And when I say systems resilience, what I mean is the ability of a, a, a company's systems to adjust to the disruption that's been introduced by COVID-19, whether that's dramatic increases in demand, dramatic decreases in demand, um, and all things in between. And I think we're finding that companies that had potentially taken steps ahead of COVID-19, certainly not in anticipation of, but you know, in some respects they got lucky that they were focused on systems resilience. They've been pretty solidly able to weather the storm, whereas companies where that just wasn't a strategic priority, they weren't focused there, you know, need to take action now and going forward to adjust to be more resilient. Um, in the face of future disruptions. So that's been a very significant pain point that we've seen across our clients. The other thing that has really emerged, and again, it's not something that wasn't there, but it had kind of fallen into the background, and that's 
cost, cost optimization, cost management, cost reduction in IT. Um, we're seeing obviously for <laughs> just every business is that, you know, getting um, refocused on that whole cost optimization component of their business it has become front and center again. So those are the two themes I would say we've seen emerging. And, um, you know, I'd love to hear what others have to say from their vantage points. Yeah, you know, a tool, uh, some of the things we're seeing, companies are revisiting the entire supply chain to find out what links in the chain are most vulnerable. You know, as we're putting contracts together and, and focusing, whether it's contract manufacturing, you know, in the traditional manufacturing outsourcing context or uh, an IT function or business process function, it's recognizing that everything is connected. Yeah. Um, all the all the all the pieces are connected. All the companies are connected, and there's just a heightened focus now on what to do and how to prepare for things that we're facing today. The other thing you know we're noticing is that companies are still doing deals, and in some cases they're accelerating them. If if the underlying reason for doing the deal hasn't changed, then parties are going ahead with the transactions. Uh, but they're they're tending now to focus a bit more on uh, some of these things that we're facing today that maybe if you did a deal six months ago or two years ago, um, you might not have been able to get people's attention uh, on dealing with this kind of risk management and, and the risk associated with displacement of, of employees, displacement of, of your service providers. Right. I think... The, the thing for me, you know, what stands out, Karen and Neil, is based on what you just shared is how the definition of risk management and what companies focus on, this crisis has made them expand that thinking. You know, often they, when they thought about risk, only looking at what the supplier was doing and what risk they brought, that they almost devalued the location risk at times. And if you think about it, this has really heightened the location risk. But it's been also interesting to watch how the resilience of different companies has been very different in this model. So I appreciate that. You know, one, one additional thing to add, uh, um, we've been um, impressed by the cooperation between providers and customers. You know, um, from a legal perspective, there's this concept of force majeure, this idea that you can be excused for your performance under a contract if certain things arise. And uh, we, we've been seeing and hearing about providers and customers working collaboratively to deal with waiving restrictions that might be in a contract that preclude remote working right. and remote access. And you talk about challenges going forward, I know we'll hit on that probably yeah. uh, with some of the other topics, but um, we've been impressed by that collaboration. So just, just um, kind of taking that thread, Vess, um, when you think about your work and the work you do at BMS, what did you stop doing? Uh, or for that matter, what did you continue to do in the sourcing space? We didn't stop anything, I don't think, actually. <laughs> I think we're working in even harder, you know, uh, because we feel that the strategy that we set out a couple of years ago is still the right one. So we are actually doing RFPs and negotiating all virtually uh, at this point in time. And we didn't slow down. It's hard. Um, it's, it's really hard and it's very exhausting to be in those long negotiations, <laughs> but we did not, we did not slow down. Uh, but what we found was that, uh, we did not realize we had this effort a couple of years ago that we called shift left, right? So for our, um, end user computing, we wanted to empower the end user to be more productive themselves. And we wanted to improve our knowledge. You can solve things yourself and all, and so on. We set up a workspace in AWS that people can uh, potentially download or use instead of their own laptops. And we did all of that as part of a strategy. We just didn't realize that the pandemic was when we really got to uh, appreciate the value of those investments. So our workforce, um, we are about, um, 30,000 employees, and then we have a contingent workers and so on, so on top of that. But everyone were productive from day one. Um, and uh, we had to educate people a little bit on the use of BPM because we had some capacity challenges there. We upgraded it in the meantime. Uh, but it, and we 
rapidly implemented teams. Um, so there were th certain things that we did, uh, but fundamentally we were able to bring on new employees because we were allowing them to get their uh, workstation uh, in AWS. So all those things we did as part of our shift left strategy paid off and that was through our sourcing strategy with different providers. Uh, all that's paid off for us. And the other piece that we're working on is to rapidly move our data center to the cloud as complementary to our own. And all of that as well helped us. It's really helped us and there's no reason to slow down. Uh, so we are, we are continuing. We are um, renegotiating. We are negotiating with new vendors, RFIs, RFPs. We're doing all of it and we haven't slowed down one bit. And this is not the time to slow down. This is the time to prepare for the future. We really, really want to prepare for the future. No, I think that's, that's well said, Bess. You know, interestingly, uh, two things that I just want to add that we saw. One is we're definitely seeing that the more resilient companies have the highest or higher amount in the cloud. And the second is there is a significant interest that I'm seeing in managed services. So the companies that were under a managed services environment, interestingly, they, they have, in the research that we have done, has, have done better because the suppliers have responded with yeah. flexibility. Yeah. Whereas in staff org, many of them didn't actually have that flexibility. Correct. I mean, to Neil's point, um, we also had rules about you have to be in the office and we had to do waivers on a case by case basis for people to work from home. So we, 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 we did what Neil just talked about. We, we, we are rethinking that. The other area where we've had a challenge is in relation to background checks. There's a huge delay uh, to get background checks. So we have to work with our legal to find out ways to allow our providers to bring on resources appreciating that the background check might be lagging. So there are those sort of things you're adopting. And then to Neil's other point around the collaboration related to performance, well, we said the service levels still apply. But of course, if one is missed, we'll talk about it. We're not going to give you a penalty or service credit if it was due to the pandemic. But if it wasn't due to the pandemic, guess what? Normal rules apply. Right. Uh, and that's how we've been working through it. And I've been amazed by our partners, how well they have performed. For sure, the wait time to the service desk went up. Absolutely, you expect yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I, th I have been really, really impressed with our partners. Um, very well-run plans, all of them providing us updates uh, and very, very strong ne network. There is no way you could do this without strong partners. It's been a really, really good experience from that point of view. So the, the outsourcing model has definitely yes. been put under the toughest test yes. it has had. <laughs> yes. And, and, it, and it's shown tremendous resilience in life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The partners we work with are absolutely amazing. I have uh, no, there is no other way to describe it. Uh, absolutely amazing, all of them. Neil, Karen, anything you want to add to that in terms of what you've seen, uh, in terms of what you stopped doing or any recommendations or not, not really recommendations or you continue to do? Yeah, I, I will say just, it, it's a little bit tied to what Vess was just saying, although I, I'm looking at it from the outside in versus the inside out maybe or the vice versa <laughs> is I, I have been just, blanketly universally impressed by what I call the culture of heroes, the people who are out there, despite this work from home order, doing everything they can to get the job done. So, you know, you think about the first responders and, and all the healthcare providers, but I feel like I see it in our industry too. It, it, it's kind of like this attitude of this will not defeat me being from home and trying to coordinate a release that normally we would do face to face as a team we're doing you know across however many zoom calls and and different nodes to get it done and and i think of that as the culture of your heroes yeah. you know that that do what it takes to get it done yeah you know we we have um neil sorry did you want to add something well, I was going to say, we, you know, we really haven't stopped doing anything. Um, we're doing it differently. And we are continuing to do 
a number of things and, and again, heightened focus on some of these things in negotiations around the business continuity, planning, the protection of data, uh, issues that are going to change a little bit as we talk about more remote working, uh, video conferencing, what's in the background behind you, you know, kids walking into rooms. It, it, it impacts confidentiality, it impacts protection of intellectual property, it impacts a lot of things that historically there's been a great um, reluctance on the customer side to allow that kind of work. But I, I don't think there's much of a choice anymore. Um, yeah. There's going to be more of that. We, we've proven we can work remotely. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens as, as cities and, and states and countries open up um, when you have a lot going back to work uh, in person, what impact is that going to have on the remote working that we've created? Um, but we haven't, we haven't changed anything. What we're seeing, though, in negotiations is, again, a willingness maybe to spend a bit more time talking about some of the issues that people didn't want to spend time talking about in the past. The other thing I think we're going to see is, and, and Vess touched upon this, there's going to have to be more flexibility um, as you contract going forward. You can't simply be the boilerplate of these are our policies. We've had these policies in place forever. Attach them to agreement and we're going to live under those. It, the world's changing. And I think we have to relook at those policies and see what really makes sense as we move forward in, in the remote world in the digital world, as things are in the cloud, um, work's changing. So I think this is a perfect segue for us to ask the first question, and I'm going to launch this poll. So one of the things that I think would be interesting for us to know about, and please everybody, uh, please cast a vote. So what, what are the, which are the following actions do you believe your company, whether you are on the buy side, the supply side, or the advisor side, or you know, what action do you believe your company will be pursuing as this crisis improves or abates? You know, review spend and cost, revisit sourcing strategy, which is you know increasing outsourcing, insourcing, increasing outsourcing, conducting health checks, implementing stronger governance, or incorporating work from home strategy into business continuity plans. You know, the one thing that I'm, I'm really starting to see at significant scale is some of the largest IT service providers and BPO providers are basically making a statement that by 2025, 75% of their workforce is likely to be work from home, not in these big offices. I saw announcements by a number of banking CEOs. You know, financial services has been really more strict about not allowing work from home, bringing people into secure workspaces. I saw them talking about the destruction of commercial real estate and a significant amount of their people working from home. And again, you know, Neil, Karen, and Vess, let's take a look at the results. I'm gonna end the poll in about five seconds and just love your reaction to what our audience is telling us. I'm gonna end the poll now. And then I'm going to display the results. So you can see over half the audience believes that work from home is going to be incorporated into, into the business continuity plans. Well, we lived it. We're living it right now. Uh, what do you think about the other answers? I, well, it's fascinating to me that 0% said they're going to increase insourcing. That's, um, if people are leaning, leaning into this, which I, I think makes sense, uh, but that's, that's fascinating to me. Yeah. yeah. That's really, um, I think that's, that says a lot about the strength of the outsourcing model. I mean, I think the focus on the answer was around business continuity first. Yes. And then, then you start thinking about savings and stuff like that. But savings is no good if you can't operate. So you need to be able to operate first. 
and then right. you then you worry about the money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, in, in every crisis, there's an opportunity. So maybe maybe let's uh, kind of transition into a different point of view. So we've experienced this, right? Six six weeks, some challenges, but tremendous um, belief in the model, great responsiveness from both sides. What are you seeing opportunities in the sourcing landscape? What, what, what stands out for you? What, what, what do you think is an opportunity that either you as a buy side or supply side or others that uh, could take advantage of or benefit from? Yeah, Atul, I, I can jump in on this. You know, we, we've talked a little bit about um, the, the digital transformation. That's just going to accelerate. I mean, we're, we're being, those that aren't doing it already are going to do it because they're forced into it. Um, so we'll see much more of that and much more of evolving ad existing agreements so that they're taking advantage of, of that transformation. Um, I, I think it'll, it'll be interesting to see if companies look to keep things more local, uh, which, you know, reduces certainly international travel if you have to go check on a provider. Um, you know, people tend to, to look inward a bit more when there are challenging environments. Um, so it'll be interesting to, to watch that. Um, I, I was on a, a video conference earlier today with several private equity investors who invest primarily in India. Uh, and it was interesting to hear them talk about how there are lots of opportunities there now and in investing in, in the business services, IT services uh, arena uh, that they think that there are, people are starting to lean into it like they did in 08, 09, 2010, uh, and that some sectors there are going to be relatively unimpacted by it. So I don't know that contrasts with this idea of keeping things local and maybe not, not offshoring. Uh, so to me, those are some pretty interesting areas to watch. Interesting. Yeah, I think uh, some of it will depend on how long this thing lasts. I, I do believe that the requiring people to travel or to meet in person in large quantities if there is no vaccine or no cure uh, becomes problematic. It's a big ethical issues, issue. So. Uh, if this continues and we have another peak next year and it, and it continues for into 21 and pot potentially beyond, I, I think the acceleration in the remote uh, business model will just continue. Um, so, and right now there is obviously no indication that a vaccine nor a cure is, is uh, forthcoming in the near future. Um, enough companies working on it, but uh, th there is nothing imminent. And the only thing that has been uh, approved to date uh, actually speeds up recovery. It doesn't actually change uh, the, the, uh, the, the rate of recovery. Just it takes 12 days instead of 15, I think. So, so there's still a lot to be done there in the clinical space. So with that unknown, I think the remote way of working will continue for sure. And therefore, I think we will find new product, right? So we do clinical trials. You have to do a clinical trial for COVID-19. So the way you do clinical trials, it had to be rethought in a, in a world where you have to get to people, um, but you can't travel. So the way you do that and protect people, I think there will be a lot of thoughts around how you, you change the approach to many things that today would have an interaction, or even how you do your doctor's visit. Um, you may not have to go in, in person anymore. Uh, you may be able to do it via Zoom, right? So I, I think there are many ways that will change in the way we interact, for better or for worse. Yeah. Karen, I thought oh. you were jumping. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that, that comes to mind, and Vess, you touched on this earlier, and, and so it's it's mostly me just reinforcing it, is I think that there is already a lot of discussion, you know, within companies about how to emerge stronger in the face of the new normal. So what steps need to be taken? You know, how do we lay a foundation for the future? How do we tackle things that sort of inhibited our 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 ability to absorb this disruption that perhaps were, were less than ideal in terms of our 
resilience. I think Neil touched on it too earlier. So again, I'll just reinforce it. I think companies are going to take a hard look at their, their partner ecosystem and understand where their vulnerabilities were exposed through that ecosystem and how to shore that up. And, and make sure that they're stronger in that perspective too. So I, I think there is going to be, and already is, and, and like I said, I think Vest touched on this, this focus on how we emerge stronger in the face of the new normal. I think, Karen, you touched on something really important there related to um, risk management, um, your own, but also for third parties. And the, you know, the cyber risks have been significantly increased because there's always those who want to take advantage of other people's misery. So for those of, uh, out there who do that, they have, they have increased their activity significantly. So phishing, cyber attacks significantly increase. So how you manage that and how you then partner with your third parties and how they manage it, as well as their obligation to inform you, even when you're not directly impacted, right? So how does that work? And those are key questions that we are working through. And these are key, if you're thinking about new terms that we will insist on putting into contracts, it will be around cyber. We realize that a cyber attack um, can happen to the best, but it's what you do when it happens that then really, really matters. So having the right protection from our point of view, and sometimes it is making sure that we are aware and we are informed when we need to be, um, are things that we are ensuring that we will build into our agreements going forward. You know, in, interestingly, this discussion on risk management, so I think you guys know that I, I chair a company called Supply Wisdom which does real-time continuous monitoring. And pre-COVID, we would have conversations about risk management and in investing in risk and moving it from assessments to real-time monitoring. And you know, other than banking, it was a hard um, acceptance. I think a lot of people have governance, but they don't necessarily do this continuous monitoring of location risk and third-party risk. Since the beginning of April, the number of queries that, are, that we are receiving has gone up over 300%. Mm. And, and the word that people are using literally is instead of using the words assessments, they are literally using the words continuous monitoring. I think you know, our research shows and our work shows that disruptions are rising not just in frequency, but also in intensity. If you think about when we have looked at absenteeism programs because of incidents, at companies and we looked at their DR, BCP plans, I never saw a plan that accounted or planned for more than 40% absenteeism, yeah. right? Yeah. Those models have changed fundamentally. It's almost like we need to rethink our base risk models. Any reactions? You know, on, on the disaster recovery business continuity front, uh, a similar reaction in terms of the duration that people have historically thought that these events would, would last. Right. Um, and we, we had an example of a supplier for a customer who the supplier was based in Wuhan. And the, the plans were developed obviously well before the pandemic and they were focused on being down for a day, being down for a week, being unavailable for even a month. But when you shut down operations for an extended period of time, a lot of these plans just don't accommodate that yeah. and haven't clearly identified a second um, source, a second location. Um, when you talk about manufacturing, how do, you, how do you move equipment from one facility to another when the borders are literally closed and no one's allowed to cross with anything? Yeah. Uh, so I think it's, it's going to require us all to rethink a lot of that depending upon the kind of service, the location of the service, the, the importance of that to your, to your business. Yeah. You know, one of the questions from the audience that I uh, love your thinking on is, you know, if you think about Zoom and WebEx and Teams and others, the, the reality is the audio and video is still pretty passive, right? It's, it's not the engaged model of uh, augmented reality, or even if you think about the Cisco product, uh, you know, kind of more live conference, but imagining this is still work from home to a large extent. Are you seeing efforts out there either within your companies or in the marketplace where there's these technologies or systems coming on board 
that are much more engaging and you know kind of also i think from a customer and um, and our perspective also much more humane in terms of how we deal or, or interact with each other well I, I think it depends on the industry that you're in uh and and sometimes the limitation here is actually your uh, provider your cell phone or your uh Wi-Fi provider and their capacity more so than than uh, necessarily what your own company is doing. Um, I think many of these new devices may still be early, but you may see an acceleration. But in the um, life sciences, you might see more of a move towards um, medical devices and apps that will allow, allow you to do more things yourself at home versus having to go to, into a hospital. So for example, there might be certain cancer treatments where today you may have to go in and see a doctor and you might be able to do some of that at home. So I do think that the, in the life sciences, there will be a more focus on enabling the patient and allowing the patient to treat themselves more. And that would, I mean, that would be a make a big difference to, to your quality of life. Yeah. Um, so the, the providers that you partner with to enable that is a, those are a new set of providers. So I, I think the, it's an incredibly exciting time, scary, unknown, but it's also incredibly exciting because you're gonna partner with really innovative companies to come up with very different ways to challenge the way we've done things in areas that we thought, oh, we can't touch that area. We're really gonna find ways to touch it because we still have to treat people who have cancer. We still have to treat people who have diabetes. We have no choice but to treat people uh, and therefore, finding ways to do that in a different way. So it's, a, it's a little bit different than, than video and, and AR, but it's more about what is a device that you could use. So it's a little bit the same as a de your device, whether that's an app or virtual reality. Yeah. Yeah, I think from what I'm hearing in the marketplace, uh, imagine those teleconference facilities where we go into a room these days, right? And you feel you're interacting with the other party across from you, making it much more viable from a cost perspective, actually at a tabletop, right? Um, basically the work from home desk. The whole use of augmented reality, I think is a very interesting yeah. um, ability. If we can get it from a price point uh, that, that we can actually do it as an individual work from home. So let me, let me move to um, the next question. And in a way we've turned, we've kind of talked about it, but I wanna, I wanna kind of dig a little bit deeper into it. So think about now where team members start to come to work. And again, you know, we may possibly never go back to what it was 100%, what it used to be. You know, maybe it's some percentage come back to work. And some are still, you know, wherever they are, work from over others. What challenges do you think we need to address or we will need to manage so that this recovery is done right? And again, remember, I'm, I'm not really talking from a medical perspective in this case or what the market does, but think about your own organizations so that we get a perspective from an advisor, supplier, and buy side. What changes do you think you'll make to manage this recovery properly for your sourcing teams or sourcing initiatives? Let me start with you, Karen. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that yet. I, I think we have a lot to learn still about what it means to come back together, like you said, um, and like Vess said, I think earlier too, around, you know, at what risk, you know, do we assume or resume larger scale gatherings and get togethers and how comfortable are people going to be and how far do we push people to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. and um excuse me I, I i i struggle with that and and it's funny i was thinking about your previous question to a tool yeah. um it just from my own you know experience to just me as one person but my own experience in this whole work from home um, environments and I, I've thought about best practices already in terms of you know being willing to have those personal conversations at the start or the end of a call so you are still getting that that thing that in the personal face-to-face -face workplace 
you get every day, which is to, to be friendly with people, to have friendships, you know, formed and, and to have them know about your families and, you know, what you did last night and, and all those things. And, and when we're on video and we're doing just conference calls, there's a tendency to shy away from that. And that's, that's unfortunate because that's what makes the workplace so important for all of us on a face-to-face -face basis. Yeah. You know, so there's that. And there's also the tools. Like I, I don't necessarily, it's funny you went to virtual augmented reality type stuff. I'm okay with video. I like it when people are on video. We do screen shares, we do virtual whiteboards, we do, you know, not just screen shares of here's what I'm gonna present to you, but let's work through this together. Let's edit together. So we are mimicking being face to face, but you know, don't get me wrong. I am still very much in the camp of being face to face as much, you know, periodically mm -hmm. makes being virtual easier. It, yeah. it can't go away. So yeah. that's my perspective. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's hard. I and mean, we talk about it all the time at the firm. It's, this is hard. This is hard to do. It's hard to, have meetings virtually, it's hard to negotiate virtually. You know, when you're sitting in a room with a client and you know, you can kick them under the table, you can elbow them in the ribs, <laughs> it's really hard to do it remotely. And you know, there's chat rooms and, but you know, it's a challenge. Each system's a little bit different and people don't recognize that you're sending a message to everybody on the video and not just privately <laughs> to the one person. And yeah. it, it, it's, it's hard and you talk about Karen best practices. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to develop those as we negotiate. So if you have a video going in a negotiation, you have your colleagues on there, you have your client, you have the counterparty, you have the counterparty's lawyers, you have a, you know, a consultant, you know, you have five or six different organizations represented on a video conference. It's hard to develop the camaraderie, Karen, that you're talking about and, and that relationship with the maybe your your the adverse party that if you're sitting in a conference room and having lunch with or or coffee you, you can develop that rapport uh, and that can facilitate the negotiations it's, it's just hard to do that virtually yeah. um, but I, I think we're all learning how to do it better uh, this is this is not going to go away you know even in however many months until a vaccine once we have a vaccine and we figure all this out this way of working it's it's here to stay in some form or fashion and we just need to figure out the best way to do it and the best way to work not just with our colleagues but also with you know with our clients yeah i agree it's difficult to read a room when everyone are just like here faces on a screen you don't really read the room in the same way as you do when you're negotiating and also when you work with a provider um i you know you just get to know them by meeting with them so it is that is much more difficult when you if you don't know them already and you're working remotely it's a little easier if you already know the people and you met with them in the past but if you choose a new provider and you've never met and all you're doing is meeting this way that is a very different uh, experience and, and that is difficult. I, I do think when it comes back to returning to work and we will obviously return back to work in a careful uh, way, I, I don't see that happening without there being some form of testing. Um, and I would expect that certainly most companies will require employees to be tested before they can go into the office, at least at some interval. So then I would also expect that if you have service providers, those sorts of requirements would also be passed on to them. So, and, and I don't know, I mean, some people might be uncomfortable with that. They may not be willing to be tested uh, and so on and so forth. So I do think that there are many things like that that is gonna pile on to what we do that we haven't thought of before and will become part of the new future uh, for the next, uh, I don't know, at least year, two years. Yeah. Best that actually one of the things that highlights is it's that's advice. What what you're saying is, if your if your supplier partners showed you that these are the things that they are doing as people come back to work, that's what gives you the reassurance that they are following good practices. Right? It's not just about them doing it, but it's about assuring you as a customer that they're actually doing those things. Right. Right. You know, that's happening, you know, a tool that's happening already in the marketplace in lots of sectors, right? The airline sector, um, you know, hotels, you know, I'm sure we're all getting inundated with emails 
<laughs> from everybody who we've, we've used in some form or fashion explaining all the things that they're doing. And I don't think it's going to be any different in the outsourcing world yeah. or in the legal world as we That's move true. forward. Yeah. Very true. You know, interesting is um, you were talking about, Karen, you were talking about this personal connection. You know, what's interesting is in, I think in as many cases, we are actually interacting with each other in a much more engaged fashion. So, you know, Neil and I probably talk once, once a month, sometimes every other week or so, but often that conversation happens through a quick text or a quick call. But now we're very like, more likely we're doing video calls where you see each other and we, and, you know, we joke with each other while we're discussing those same things. So in many cases, our conversations are actually richer than they often used to be. Yeah, that's we're with or without emojis. <laughs> well, and it's funny you say that, Atul. So I'll just give you another example from my perspective. One of my personal favorite things has been when I'm speaking to people in other geographies, and especially while I live in Cleveland and we were completely holed up and having snow in April, and I can hear their, the birds chirping in the background. Those are things I love, and people want yeah. to apologize for that, and I have exactly the opposite reaction now. I'm like, no, I'm so happy to hear that, even if it's halfway around the globe. It's, it's birds. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think that you're right. I think there is a lot more of that. Um, it's kind of like you're opening up your home to people. Yeah. I That's think the very level, personal. Yeah, the level of acceptance of, you know, this little variance is actually becoming much is okay, and I think that's to me that's a much more humane way of interacting. So, so what if a dark dog barks one? It's okay, right? And uh, I, I think there's there's a more much bigger human connection there. Let let me just uh, mention a couple of things, and I've, I've I've another question to you that will also take to a poll, and thanks to the feedback from our attendees, we're gonna make the next poll multiple choice. So you'll be able to pick uh, many. So, you know, interestingly, one of the things I noticed is, so we've been bringing people on board. We've been hiring during this whole process. Um, we noticed that trying to train somebody from the very beginning entirely remotely, because we had never done it that way, has actually been a challenge. Because as they were learning and coming up to speed, they could turn to a colleague and ask a question, turn to another colleague and ask a question, now they have to formally reach out to somebody to ask a question as they're coming up to speed. So a, a challenge. The second piece that I would love your comments on is, you know, in the sourcing process, one of the things I've noticed is clients been very okay in our advisory business moving through the cycle until they came to the collaborative solutioning process. So this is a process that's the, almost the final part of the selection. Sometimes they're trying to pick one between two suppliers or two between three suppliers. And so there's this co-creative solutioning process that happens and not feeling comfortable doing that in this remote distributed fashion. Any comments on how could somebody get past it? Or if you have, how have you gotten past it? I mean, I think it'd be good advice for the audience. I think we're, we're, you know, struggling to find some good advice there. It's, uh, it's, it's difficult. I mean, we've onboarded employees during this time, and it is very hard to to get them engaged. You do miss those, you know, walking down the hallway, running into somebody. You miss the, you know, going into somebody's office and putting something on a whiteboard. I'm a visual, I'm a visual learner and explainer, and. Um, I need to see those things and work through them. And it's, it's just, it's exhausting to do it on video. Uh, and it's, it's tiring to constantly be scheduling things. You just don't have those off chance meetings like you, you would normally have. Um, in terms of the collaboration, I, you know, you use as many tools as you can find and figure out the best way to use them. But it, it's really, there's no substitute for doing it in person, side by side. Yeah, yeah. Totally, oh, go ahead, Vess. No, I was just going to say, I also miss the whiteboard. I, I, I <laughs> love drawing things out on the whiteboard and I, I really miss it. And I find that not having that is just taking so much more energy to, to share and pass on the message. So 
and maybe over time we'll figure out how to do that better. Um, and we, we also have, so we have been running a training program, um, collaboration training program we run with our key providers who've been doing it for close to 10 years. Uh, we call it teamwork, together everybody achieves more. Uh, and it's a full day thing that we do and we bring people together and we, we work with people to understand, appreciate differences to how to come to a win-win type situation. Uh, it's, it's a really nice program and then we have various things we use um, to reinforce um, the behaviors we're looking for, which is around collaboration uh, and respect for each other. Um, but now we have to reinvent that program to, to do it virtually because now it's more important than it ever was and we realize that. So our next thing we will be working on and is to how do we do this in a way virtually where we can still engage. We, so we have multiple vendors typically together in the room. How can we recreate that? I don't know the answers to that. We'll have, probably have to experiment, but we will find the answer um, because we will have to do it. And it is really important to do, particularly now, and creating that, uh, we, we want to remove white space between our providers, right? So we want them to actually work well together because that actually helps us. Uh, so that is what we're working on and we will definitely try to figure out good ways to do that going forward as well. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, Vess, I, I actually, I'm sitting here thinking, if anyone's going to master that, I think it'll be you. And it'll be good to hear <laughs> what you do to make that work. Because I think, Atulia, you've touched on one of the things that is the biggest head scratcher or puzzle for me. And, you know, I see it in various facets of my existence, not just professionally. I have a son who's going to start work this summer and he's already scheduled for virtual rather than in-person orientation and training and, and getting started. And, and, you know, to go through that without being face to face is just, it's foreign for all of us. It's going to be all he knows. So I'm guessing he's going to just figure out how to make it work, but it's just such a puzzle and I see it, you know, personally too with college age kids and, you know, there are schools that are talking about perhaps not even having freshmen start next year. I don't know what that would look like and I'm hoping that's just a bad idea because you don't want to see that go away, but you can also see how that would be so unusual to have your freshman year if it's not in person. So, so I, I am really, these are head scratching things for me and I'm really excited to hear. So like I said, Vess, I'm excited to hear what you do to sort of master this thing because it is, it's, I'm, I, I'm not one to be speechless, but it's an area where I am somewhat speechless in terms of ideas on how you, you, you know, slay the dragon here. Cause I think it's going to be hard to deal with. I'm, opt things. I'm optimistic that out of this will come a lot of innovation and it's going to come from from all sources and it's going to come from the young people too, Karen. It's going to come from those, you know, freshmen in college who are going to live this in a different way than, than all of us. And I, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful. Um, it's a terrible time for all of us to be going through this. And uh, but I, I think it's going to force innovation that might have taken a long time i think it's going to accelerate it and so hopefully a lot of good comes out of that innovation yeah that's a great positive spin on it neil i love it <laughs> so one question that i'm going to ask you at the very end so i'd like you to make sure you think about it which is you know as you think about the step forward what advice would you give to buyers and suppliers right now and, and also advisors, so and pick any one of those, one of those three or two or three of those. So that'll be the final question I'm gonna ask you. What advice do you give so they continue to be successful? So let me just ask a final question before I go to that. So kind of a pre-final question, and I'm gonna uh, actually activate a poll also as I do that. So one of the things that we're seeing because of this shutdown of business in some businesses, it has had no impact. In others, it's increased their business, but there's been plenty of businesses that have suffered tremendously, right? So they're having to make significant adjustments to their sourcing strategies today 
and in the very near future. So, and I'll, I'll like the panelists to, you know, Karen, uh, Neil, and Wes to comment on it. But first, audience, if you could please answer this poll, which is, you know, which of the following adjustment or changes are you most likely to make or see in the sourcing strategies as we move forward? And please, this is a multiple choice since you, uh, one of the audience asked before we've made that change. So I, I hope more of you answer while we talk about it. Um, while, while they're filling out the answers, I'm gonna give them a little bit longer, maybe, um, uh, Vess, why don't we start with you? Is, as you think about some of these choices, you know, are you considering any of these as you think about the future? Or yes. Yeah. Um, the um, the the uh, well, the best efficient service provider. I think you always need to look at your your provider mix. Um, the um, and also augment your key providers with s smaller innovative ideas that maybe be able to introduce new digital product. Um, but at the end of the day, it's so much about war on talent and the access to the right talent and the highly talented people. So from a provider point of view, uh, we just had a presentation this morning actually on this very topic as part of our RFP where the provider took us through their talent management strategy, how they uh, attract their div their commitment to diversity and inclusion, which is, means a lot to us, and what they do to train and retain their talents. Because the way for me, I, I want to reduce reliance on contractors and the way for me to do that is to know I can get the resources I need through the service providers that we have. So they go together. Um, so that would be definitely an advice to service providers would be, remember you're only as good as your people. And the only way you can say, sell a solution to us is by highlighting the people that you will bring to the table and how we can get access to good talent so they can actually do the work we need them to do. Karen and Neil, as you look at these results, uh, anything that stands out for you that what's kind of opposite of what you thought or absolutely in line with what you were thinking or experiencing. Yeah, I, you know, the, the switch to the better fit locations, that's a, a comment I made earlier in, in the webinar. I do think we're gonna see people focus more on that. So that, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, the better fit service providers too. It, I think that's right in line with what what Karen and and Bess have been speaking to. So uh, these answers don't surprise me. And then you see the in source more 13% versus it was you know zero percent in the in the prior question, which is a little bit of a different question. But the, these align with what we're hearing, what we're seeing, and and frankly, what I would be expecting to see. Yeah. So I have one. Um variation to what Neil just said, I might have expected, and so I'm surprised to see it there, is that location starts to become less important. And, and um, you know, we're all virtual right now. It's like, you know, the old adage of location, location, location doesn't matter anymore because we have figured out how to be globally, virtually, effective and productive. And so I am curious about the location point and, and I'd love to be able to probe that more. Obviously we can't on the call, but just what does that really look like and what does that really mean going forward um, when regardless of where you live, if you're working from home, does it matter where you live? Yeah. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So Karen, um, hopefully, uh IOP, if you could move the slides so people can see the survey. So right now we're doing a survey where some of those questions are being asked in terms of where did people see the biggest disruption, both in a provider or a location? And interestingly, again, because of the risk work that we do, there is a significant difference that we have seen in locations. There are certain locations that shut down early and literally shut down call centers as an example. Even essential people could not go to work. And so the difference was, in that case, the difference was about law regulations and execution of those regulations. In other cases, was an issue, the difference existed because 
the infrastructure was excellent in the work location, but not so great in the home location. And so I think location, interestingly, still continues to play a role, uh, play a role even though work from home might be a location option that is irrelevant regardless of where you are. But unfortunately, the cities and countries are actually very different. So um, let me, let me. It's just one, uh, one relevant comment here uh, in the chat, which is actually depends on what you do. If you manufacture, you actually, and you make goods, you actually need to be in a, uh, where physically be in the manufacturing site. If you work for Amazon in a warehouse, you actually have to, someone has to touch that package at some point in time. So there are actually movement of goods and production of goods still require people physically touching things. Right, but Karen's, I think Karen's point on services in, intuitively makes sense, uh, but we, as we know, our locations are different. Yeah. So let me, let me bring the panel. There's some great questions coming out and I, I apologize that we're not gonna be able to get to all those questions, but one of the things we will do is we'll respond and make sure that they're available on the recording along with the recording as they're put out. One of the things I wanted to do is because I know people are looking for advice from each one of you, right? So think about if you're advising, whether it's a fellow buy side person, fellow supply side person, or a fellow advisor, and you're advising them on what they should be doing now or what they should be watching out for, the top one or two things, what would be that advice from you to them? I'll take whoever's ready first. <laughs> well, so when we look at providers, we are actually looking for providers who can help us find solutions. So don't come and ask us, we don't want to be give, we don't want to be the one who have all the ideas. We really want providers that can partner with us that have the idea that can help us drive the strategy. So, so that's number one, prove that you actually can get us to the future, help us define the future, help us get there. and. And as I was mentioning earlier, we realize you need people to do that. So show us how you manage talent uh, and how you manage the uh, diversity of your talent. Thank you, Vess. You know, I, I'd say once you get past identifying the right parties, you know, the right provider for the right customer, the right scope, from a lawyer's perspective, I'd say, you know, you want to be disciplined in the contracting process, you know, careful, take your time, focus on what those risk factors are and how can you mitigate them, identify them and, and figure out the mitigation strategies. And in some cases, it's remote workforce, in some cases, it's a second location, in some cases, it's what do we do if there's a data breach, what are the steps we're going to take in communicating and, and mitigating that risk. Uh, but I think a lot of the things that we're seeing now in in the outsourcing world are things we've talked about for a very long time in contracting and may not have gotten everybody's attention. And now I think you'll find people spending a bit more time looking at these issues and thinking about what it would mean to be remote, what it would mean um, to have to invoke your business continuity plan. And can you actually do it? And can you do it for an extended period of time? It's not a day a week, it's, and now it's months and it could be, yeah. it could be a year and a half. Thank you, Neil. I think until the thing I would add, and we've all been talking about it, I think the entire call, but it's just finding those ways to sustain or reinvigorate the collaboration, the open communication, the transparency, all of those things that we rely on when we're face-to-face. -face. I think someone talked about reading body language and how much harder that is in our current environment. It's finding those creative ways to make all of the things that make this whole process hum still hum. Right, thank you, Karen. You know, my, my final advice to the audience would be IOP is a unique organization, a unique resource. It's a unique place where the buyers, suppliers, advisors, academics, we all come together. So lean on IOP, right? This is, this is the reason why we as a board came together because we wanted to share our perspectives. And please look forward to the next webinar because we'll be back as this situation 
either prolongs or improves, we are a resource that you all as members of IOP and as stakeholders in IOP can depend on. Karen, Vess, and Neil, thank you so much for making time. Really appreciate you openly and candidly sharing your expertise. Thank you again. Thanks, Atul. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank all the attendees. Thank you. Thanks. And to the, and to the audience, uh, there's, this survey will close on Friday. We will provide the results to everybody that responds. So please make sure when you get a chance, you go to the survey on IOP.org and look for the survey. Thank you again, everybody, and take care. Thank you. Thank you.